happy Mother's Day. Looking around, all the ladies. It is so nice to see you here this morning. And uh, for all of you who are praying to be mothers, we'll continue to pray together. For all of you stepmothers and grandmothers and all the other mothers, welcome. Uh, This is a very uh, important message this morning that is being brought to you by all the ladies of Mission Bible Church. Uh, It was uh, almost every year after, uh, I think it's Father's Day, I get a group of gals who come up, sometimes one, sometimes uh, a a little posse, and they say something along the lines of, well, how come, you know, when, whenever it's Mother's Day, you always preach things that are so nice and, and you celebrate us, and then when we get to Father's Day, you give the men the hammer. Uh, when are we going to get the, the hammer? And so I absolutely love that heartbeat. I think it's great. I love that the men of this church show up and show out on Father's Day. In fact, last year, I think I told you, we had our highest attendance of the whole calendar year on Father's Day because the men of the church said, we're going to be in church. Our families are going to be in church. We're not going to the beach. I also love the fact that the ladies in the church uh, are going, hey, listen, we don't want tulips today. We want truth. And so I'm going to give it to you. Uh, this is what y'all asked for, and so I want to, to, to make sure that you get truth today. In fact, it was a couple months ago now that I was watching a, a documentary uh, on Hillsong. And most of you probably know about Hillsong, kind of a big movement for a long time that's uh, come on uh, better days, of course, lately, having issues. And it was intriguing because they talked about Brian Houston, the founder, all the way to, you know, Carl Lentz, kind of the implosion of his story and the rise of the music. Uh, it talked about the world domination dreams that they had. And then, of course, even uh, toward the end, the lies and the deceit and the scandal of the whole movement. Uh, but what I thought was fascinating, I know the documentary is a couple years old now, was simply how many women, as I was watching the documentary, were attracted to that movement. Not to say there weren't men involved too. But as I'm watching the documentary, I'm seeing women in the interviews. I'm seeing women doing the interviews. I'm seeing women as singers. I'm seeing a lot of females as fellow preachers and teachers with the leaders. I was watching the congregation. And by and large, it's lopsided towards females. And so this morning, what I wanted to do is put in front of you and kind of show you why it is that false movements will so often target and attract a largely female audience. I also wanted to show you why even things like cults, whether that was Jonestown or Manson or whoever, they act, honestly often will attract a large group of, of women. And most importantly, this morning, what I wanted to do is put in front of you the tools so that you would be protected And really, we would ensure that you never become one of those women who is distracted, pounced on, or deceived by a false movement, a false teaching uh, that can steal your joy and sincerely corrupt your your faith. And so, happy Mother's Day. That's the sermon. (laughs) If you have your Bibles, open them with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, And it's a a wonderful book that I've enjoyed for many years, and we're only going to study basically two verses here, but I want you to to read over the first five verses of chapter three to get context. Uh, And I would guarantee across the world today, uh, we are probably the only church uh, that are using Mother's Day to study these two verses, and so uh, I think you'll prayerfully enjoy them and certainly grow. Uh, so 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, of course, Paul is writing to his young protege in the faith. And I want you to notice that in chapter 3, really some of the final words that he ever writes before he dies, uh, he puts a prophetic slash pessimistic warning in front of his young protege about the final epoch, uh, what we could call the church, the, the final age uh, that we are, of course, living in now. And he says in chapter 3, verse 1, He says, realize this, Timothy, that in the last days, difficult days, difficult times will come. And so you can see right there, this is a prophetic text leaning forward. It is a very pessimistic text where he says, hey, get it right. Man's not going to usher in the kingdom. That's a big thing right now online. Uh, These small groups of men who think we're going to usher in the kingdom for Jesus Pretty clear in the Bible, we won't. Rome didn't do it. Crusaders didn't do it. Muslims didn't do it. Anglicans didn't do it. 
Napoleon didn't do it. Hitler didn't do it. Science hasn't done it. America won't do it. And the Great Reset and on and on and on isn't going to do it. Uh, the reality is, is we're sitting on this ball of dirt, as you all know, and we're, we're, we're spinning. And every five seconds, one of us gets a little life. And throughout history, there's been every subsequent generation who comes on the scene who says, well, financially and scientifically and politically and philosophically, here's the way that we're going to be the ones to fix the world. And the reality is, is it's not going to happen. There is only going to be one who returns, and he will be the one who fixes the world. And then he goes on in chapter 3, verse 2, and he gives us here the categories. He says, for men will be lovers of self and lovers of money, boastful and arrogant, revilers and disobedient to parents, ungrateful and unholy, Unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without self-control, brutal haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And we don't have time to go into all of that today, but I don't think that there's one of us in the room who's watching the news right now and going to disagree. That's where we're at. I mean, those categories there of ignoring a creator, making ourselves the standard, exalting money, chopping down other people... Attacking the family unit, never giving thanksgiving, claiming there's no moral absolutes, and then living by our animal instincts is simply what we see all around us every single day. In fact, if you ever wondered about the the logical absurdity of what's happening right now on college campuses and universities, where you have students who are making tent cities... And and, and meanwhile, they're flying a pride flag with one hand, and meanwhile, they're bowing down to Sharia law which murders homosexuals and and women, the absolute illogical, irrational nature of it points to the pagan subjectivism that we live in, where everyone goes, I don't know what anything means, I just want to go after my impulses. I just want to live for whatever I want to live for, and whatever in the moment sounds good to me, I'm going to go after it, and I'm going to yell and scream until I get my way. And of course, the worst of it is right there in verse 5. The pinnacle, the zenith of it, he says, is that there's going to be a group or movements that hold to a form of godliness. Uh, You picture it like a caterpillar. It's going to be changing and morphing all the time is the Greek word. A form of godliness, an external religion, a shell. It's going to be a veneer. Although they have denied, look at closely, its power. It's going to look religious. He says it's going to look Christian on the outside, but meanwhile, it's going to have no power to truly transform people on the inside. And so they're going to flock into it, thinking they give their money to it, but the reality is it doesn't really change who they are. Uh, So real quick question for you here. What, according to Paul, is the greatest threat to Christianity in the final epic of this age. What is it? The greatest threat to Christianity is Christianity. They're going to have buildings, and they're going to have songs, and they're going to have pulpits, and they're going to have preachers. And people are going to flock into these buildings because it looks like a wonderful religion that worships God. But on the inside, it doesn't transform or change a life. In fact, I just met a guy this week. I was at the coffee shop over here, and um, he came up to me, and he, he said, hey, can I talk to you? I had never met him. I, I said, sure. He sat down at the, the chair next to me, and, and he began to share his story. Uh, he said, hey, hey, listen, I'm going through a really hard time. Tears kind of grew in his eyes there. And he said, you know, I'm living this kind of lifestyle, a really, really, really horrible lifestyle. Uh, and I, I've got HIV and, 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 and I'm addicted to meth. And he was telling me. So I finally just said, hey, listen, can I talk to you about Jesus? And he said, well, I, I know all about Jesus. And then he began to tell me, you know, I grew up in one of these, I won't name it, local mega churches in the area, and I, and I know Jesus loves me, and one day I'm going to be an angel with Jesus. And I, now, I want you to understand what's going on here. Here's a man, utterly broken, absolutely immersed in a lifestyle of blatant sin and rebellion against the living God, and yet he somehow holds on to a truth from some local megachurch that he has true Christianity. But that 
Christianity has never changed him. That's what he's talking about. And then he says that it's going to come in. Look at verse 6. It's going to come in and it's going to be sinister. In fact, the word he uses in verse 6 is predatory. You see it there? Among them, these movements are those who enter into the households. And then the word there, you can underline, is they captivate uh, that, that's, that's a word like, uh, anybody ever seen the Discovery Channel when they've got the gazelles that are roaming over the African safaris, you know, the, the, the plains, and then off in the, in the high grasslands, you have the, the lions, and their little pride is kind of sneaking up on them, and then there's always the kind of somber baritone announcer who, who says, little did they know that off in the distance, There was a pride of lions making their stock. And in your mind, you're going, I don't want to watch this because in the back of the gazelle herd, there's what? The the poor little straggler who's sitting there and he's kind of behind everybody else. And then the lions are encroaching and you know what's about to happen and you want to look away, but you lean in anyway and suddenly, boom, he's got him. And all the other lions jump in and they're pulling him down and there's blood spurting out and the poor little gazelle is making sad sounds. That's the terminology he uses here. They enter into households, and then they they pounce. But notice who they pounce on. You see it in verse 6? Who is it? Who do they target? Holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, Among them are those who enter into households and they captivate, read it with me, weak women. Happy Mother's Day. (laughs) In fact, in Greek, that's what we call a neuter diminutive. And it just means that it really is a a term of derision. It it means in vernacular, you know, the straggler, the the, the woman who's kind of left behind and lonely and anxious. And she she doesn't have a community of faith to protect her. And then these false teachers are going to sneak in and then whack, they're going to to steal her and they're going to devour her is what he says. And interestingly then, he goes on in just two verses. The only two verses we'll study this morning before you go out to brunch. And he talks about what makes some women, obviously men too, but here talks about women, vulnerable. What makes some women spiritually vulnerable to these false movements? Whether it's a cult, whether it calls itself Christian, why are some women prone to be pounced on? And if you have a pen, pull it out. We'll just go ahead and work through these real quickly. And you can put them there in the margin, and I'll put them on the screen for you. So number one, he says there's going to be a vulnerability a vulnerability because she's burdened by her guilt or her sin. And you can see it right there in verse 6. Weak women who are weighed down with their sins. And by the way, that's perfect passive, meaning that's a state of anxiety, a state of angst where she's walking around and there's a loaded conscience and she's, she's feeling overwhelmed by, by her conscience and by what she's done. In fact, uh, it was just a couple of Christmases ago, we had a girl over to the house and she had been in a cult and she got saved and she'd been coming to the church. And so, you know, Bree and I invited her over and what a fascinating conversation that was. You know, this girl was bright, she was sharp. In fact, anyone here, if I asked you, I said, hey, do you think she could get nabbed by one of those creepy cults? You would go, no way. Smart, bright, pretty strong. And so I asked her, I said, hey, you seem really, really bright. So can you help me understand how you got nabbed by these guys? And she said, she said well, actually, I knew it was weird. And I knew that it was legalistic. And I didn't even really want to be a part of it. I said, well, then why in the world did you get nabbed by a cult? And she said, because they were the only people who would offer me solutions. I said, solutions to what? She said to everything that I was wrestling with and struggling with on the inside. Now, everyone in the room understands this. Let's just be real open and honest this morning. Don't we all struggle at times with guilt? Guilt is a part of the human condition. Because back when Adam fell, the reality was we were all birthed into, because we're all children of Adam, we were birthed into condemnation. We were birthed into being rebels 
into a fallen world against a holy God. But then what happens is we actually begin to grow up, and by the time we hit maybe six or seven, we begin to realize not only am I birthed into sin, but I actually do what? I commit sin. And then by our teenage years, we've got this thing that goes off inside of us, Romans chapter 2, called the conscience. Anybody know what that is? I call it the fire alarm uh, that's inside of me. And sometimes it beeps too often, other times it beeps not enough, but the reality is, is all humans are born with this thing called a conscience, and so we very early on in our teenage years have a decision to make. When the beeping goes off, either I'm going to do the thing, by the way, that we all do, which is when that thing starts beeping in the middle of the night and it's telling us the batteries are running low, we walk in and we take it, we unscrew it, and we toss it over in the corner. Is that not true? Come on, y'all, you pull the bat. Now, fire marshals, I'm sorry, but we all do it, okay? Doop. Doop. Doop, doop. See, some of you right now are having some kind of PTSD because of that, <laughs> right? And then you can't figure out which one it is. And you go from room to room to room, and you look for it. Here's the decision that you have to make. Either when that thing starts beeping, I'm going to reach up, pull it off the wall, I'm going to throw it in the dumpster and not listen to it, or I'm going to have to call 911, call the fire department, and say, get on out here, I need help. The same thing is true when we're developing in our teenage years and the conscience is starting to fire. Most of us, however, do not call 911, do not fall on our knees and turn to Jesus. What do we do? We reach up, we unhook it, and we throw it in the dumpster. And we go on with our sin. And soon we're weighed down. So we can sympathize with this woman. Can't we? Let's say by now she's midlife. And she, like every other eight-year-old, when she was little, thought, when I get married, everything's going to be perfect. Perfect. If I can just marry a perfect husband, I will be totally joyful and my rest of my life, rest of my life is going to be perfect. How'd that work out, by the way, ladies? Is he, is he you know, I see, it's Mother's Day. You, you, you can be honest. How's he doing? Is he perfect? Oh, but then if we can just get the house with the white picket fence, then it's going to be okay. And all my fears and anxieties and jealousies and covetousness and all the fantasies are all going to go away. I'm going to be fine. No more guilt. And then I'm going to have babies. I'm going to love those little babies. Like, they're going to be sitting up here smiling at the audience just like they were earlier. I'm going to have a perfect one. And then all of a sudden, what happens? Let's be honest. It's midlife. Got two screaming toddlers back there in the corner. Hubby's been off at work. Put on a few pounds. The wine's not soothing. Hubby hasn't touched me in months. And suddenly my brain is racked with what? Jealousies and coveting and fantasies and guilt. And what do I do? I go to my phone and I begin scrolling during nap time. And on Instagram, what do I see? Oh, there it is. A church with cool lights. And the music sounds like Coldplay. And the preacher is one hot stud. Not this church, different church. <laughs> and he's saying it's all about me. My purpose and my destiny. Amen. And he's got you. He's got you. Which leads to number two. Vulnerability, not just because she's burdened by her guilt, but vulnerability because number two, he says, because she's led by her. Now, i got to say this really soft before we put it on the screen. Ladies, it's Mother's Day. I know that I love you. I say this with utter compassion, so I'm going to do it in a whisper, and you can email uh, Pastor Brian at missionbible.org, okay? Here we go. Because he says she is led by her, ready, her feelings. Verse 6, these are the movements who enter into households and they captivate weak women who are weighed down with their sins 
and then led on, look at it there, that's the term for like, you ever seen a big bowl and it's got a ring in its nose? And the entire mass of this strong bowl is being led by this, this little string because the, the, the nose guides him, or like a stallion who's being led by the, the little bit in its mouth. That's the picture here. She's being led on by various diverse, ready, impulses, passions, emotions. We might call it whims, where it's like a squirrel. She's looking around. She's going, I just want that. I want that. I want that. Whatever I feel, I crave. It just drives her, he says. Now, real bit of encouraging news here. You ready? Is that all across the Bible, there are beautiful examples of women who didn't live that way. In fact, they were the opposite. They didn't go with their emotions. They went with what was godly. I mean, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was a great example she, she's literally sitting in her, her house, probably a teenager, and she's sweeping away and cleaning things. <laughs> and then Gabriel shows up. And in Luke chapter 1, Luke says, Gabriel freaked her out. She was, he said, troubled, terrazzo. She, she was overwhelmed with fear. She wanted to run. That was what her impulse said to do. But what does she do? She says, oh, Lord, I am but a bondservant. Do with me as you please. She made a choice to do what was right, regardless of what her feelings were. How about this one, another one? Remember Mary of Bethany? Remember her sister, Martha, who invites Jesus over for some brunch? And what does she immediately begin doing? She's freaking out. The, the Bible tells us she's overwhelmed. And so she's going around, she's anxious, she's cooking, she's cleaning, she's fixing everything. And then what's Mary doing? Mary's over here, she's chilling with a chai tea latte listening to Jesus. And so Martha flips her lid. Mary! Get in here. Don't you understand? It's hospitality time. And all the disciples are watching us and a rabbi is in the room. And remember what Jesus said to her. He said, Martha, Martha, stop it. Your feelings of anxiety are wrong. Mary has, key word, chosen what is good. How about this one, my favorite, Ruth. I love Ruth. Bree and I have done studies on Ruth for people before. We just love doing it because here you have two daughters-in-law. They both lost their husbands. Naomi's going from Moab back to her, back, back to her hometown. And then two daughters-in-law are going with her. And then Orpah is the one who gives into the feelings and the emotions and says, it's too much for me. I'm going back to Chemosh and back to my family. But Ruth does what? No, I'm making a choice. Your people will be my people. Your nation will be my nation. Your God will be my God. I don't care what the feelings say. I'm going with what is right. So there are examples in the Bible of women who said, I'm not living off my feelings. But now, here comes the quiz. All right, ladies, this is for you. Okay? Where did, you ready, the whole idea of follow your feelings originate? What was the very first example in all of history of when someone came to someone else and said, hey, listen, I don't, want you to, I don't want you to do what you're told to do. Instead, I want you to do what you feel you want to do. All right, gentlemen, you can help your wives. <laughs> help her out. When was it? Bingo. In the Garden of Eden, Eve is approached by Lucifer... And what does he say? Now, by the way, where's Adam? Gentlemen, Eve needs her Adam. He should have been there protecting his wife. We're going to talk about that in a second. That's Father's Day, too. So get ready. <laughs> Where were you? But then Lucifer rolls up, and what does he say? Hey, I know that you, you've been told that God is the one in control, and he has the knowledge, and he doesn't want you to eat the fruit, but if you eat the fruit, guess what? Then you can be like God. And then what does Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 say? Do you remember? It says, when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, listen to this closely, and that the tree was, here's your word in Hebrew, desirable, lustworthy, could make her feel good, he's got her. And Eve is the first example of a woman who made a decision to say, I'm not going based on what God told me to do, I'm going to follow my heart. 
Now, it would not be a Mother's Day at Mission Bible Church if I did not pick on Disney. <laughs> right? So here it is, just my typical annual rant on Disney, okay? Understand, all Disney is is the modern satanic siren song of follow your heart. It's nothing but 6,000 years of history played out again for now the last few generations. And by the way, Disney has absolutely destroyed the last three generations of young women. And if you're in the room, you're going, I don't understand that. Think about this. Have you ever seen a Disney movie that did not tell you, throw off your authorities, Throw off the elders, throw off the community of faith, and just find out what's on the inside of you, and then you chase it, and when you come back, you're going to be the hero, and everyone's going to be cheering for you. By the way, how'd that work out in real life? And those are now the young people that are burning down our city streets and running our country. Paul said it would happen. So listen closely, beloved sisters in Christ. If you live off of your cravings, you are incredibly vulnerable to false teachers. If you live off the craving of, I just want sex, I just want to be attractive, I just want to be somebody, I just want to be in the know, I just want to be popular, I just want friends, I just, I just, I just need this. The reality is, here we go. You're going to end up on an afternoon during nap time, pulling out your phone and scrolling Instagram. Oh, look, the church with pretty lights. Oh, look, the music sounds like Coldplay. Oh, look, the pastor's one hot stud. Not this church. And he's saying, it's all about me. And he's got you. Which leads to number three. Let's finish it, okay? Number one, there's a vulnerability because she's burdened by guilt. Number two, there's a vulnerability because she's led by feelings. Number three, there's a vulnerability, you ready? Because she's ignorant of the truth. The truth. The real truth. See verse 7? She's led on by various impulses, always learning, meaning she's a, a data collector, you know, she's, she's living in every fad, she's online all the time, just whatever, whatever she can flip and scroll through, she's taking it in, like a squirrel, what's that, what's that, what's that, what's that, what's that, I'm looking for answers, somebody give me answers, he says, she's always learning, but never able to come to the epigenosis, the, the full understanding of the definite article, the truth, the gospel, the sound Doctrine. Now, let's go ahead and just do a little survey here, okay, ladies? A Mother's Day quiz. You quiz yourself. Here we go. Question number one. i got three questions for you. Here we go. Number one, all the ladies, sincere evaluation of your own life, your spiritual status, and your vulnerability. Number one, are you prone to bouncing around for answers all the time? Just generally. Always looking for new things. Yoga. A little bit of wine, a little bit of weed, astral projections and, and, and new age and astrology. And you know, I, want, I want to read the tea leaves now and I want to get my friends together. I want, I want to try to conjure things. Bethel and Hillsong and subjectivism and, and Anglicanism and Catholicism and, and, and whatever mysticism. I'm always looking for new things. Are you prone to that? Whatever fad is out there. Which leads to number two, question number two. Are you prone to bouncing around a lot for answers? Which leads to number two. And you always tend to land, ready, on a cheap, easy gospel. I call it a cozy gospel. Meaning it's a self-affirming gospel. It's a type of gospel that says, God loves you and you have purpose and you are a woman of destiny and that's where it ends. But it's not the full gospel. It's not creation and fall and redemption. It's not that the world was created perfect, but man has been in rebellion against God. And so God sent his only son to live a perfect life and die a sacrificial death, 
to be raised on the third day according to the scriptures where he ascends to the right hand of the Father and he will one day come back to distribute perfect justice and unless you take your life and you bow before him and you throw your trust upon him, you're not going to have any option except to burn forever in judgment. He is the solution and his atoning death was painful and sacrificial as God himself poured out his wrath upon his own son and it causes us to arise from our knees and say, Lord, I want to serve you and no one else for the rest of my life. It's a true, full-orbed gospel. And it costs a lot for Christ to die. Which leads to question three. Do you bounce around, tend to land on a cozy little Teddy Ruxpin gospel? By the way, that's an 80s reference right there for you. Little cute cabbage patch doll gospel. And thereby remain ready unchanged from the inside. See, when God takes over a heart, the person who is saved for heaven is thereby saved for holiness. Who he justifies, meaning he declares not guilty, he will sanctify and he will change from one degree of glory to the next all the way to completion when they are forever perfected in heaven. So if you've encountered the real gospel, you will find that your life begins to change. In fact, Martin Luther, when he was preaching to his congregation years and years and years ago, said um, this analogy. He said, ladies, imagine it's like, um, imagine it's like you're, you, you were mortally ill, like terminally ill, and you were dying today. Again, happy Mother's Day. And then he said, he said, and imagine right now the doctor came in and he held up a pill. He said, this is a $35,000 pill, and if I give it to you right now, you're going to start getting better. You're going to be well. And so you're sitting here, and you're, you're, you're actually right now, you picture yourself picking up the glass, you know, and it's, it's shaking in your hand, and then the little pill, $35,000 is going to go in, it's going to restart all your white blood cells to fix the issue, and you put it in your mouth, and you drink your water, and as it goes down, the doctor says, that's it, you're better. You said, I'm still feeling weak. He says, that's okay. In a day, you're going to be back up and at him. Then Luther said, that's exactly what happens with true conversion. The moment you take the true gospel, he says you're going to begin a journey of purification. And even though you may not feel like it right now, this moment, you're already, you've already been made well. Do you guys see what Paul has just done here, the matrix that he has set up? Ladies, did you catch it? Here, here it is, ready? He started off by saying what? He said, hey, <laughs> people are weighed down by sin. Ladies, you're, you're burdened by guilt because you've got feelings that are driving the show because those feelings are untamed by truth. And then Paul says, it's real simple. Pour truth in, which will begin to tame your feelings. And once you're no longer living by feelings, you're going to see purity begin to take over your life. Which means that at nap time, when you're scrolling Instagram, oh, there's the church with fancy lights. Their music sounds like, sorry, redundant, I know. And that pastor, what a hot stud. Can I get an amen? Yeah. <laughs> Ushers, can you take him out, please? <laughs> and he's saying, it's all about me. Take your pink sweater and your fancy shoes and shove it. Because it's not about me. It's all about, come on, it's all about Christ. I 
All right, 30 seconds. Ladies, you got a pen? Let me give you three things in 30 seconds that are going to be your, your antidote to avoiding counterfeit. Here it is. And Hillsong hookers and whatever else you want to call them, Hillsong hooks. Here they are. I didn't mean it that way. Okay, number one. <laughs> Here it is. Here it is. Number one. Ready? Real obvious. Here it is. Memorize the scriptures. You want the antidote, you got to pour in the truth. Memorize the scriptures and that, be creative with it. You know, find a friend. Find a, a friend and go, hey, let's do one verse a week. Or let's do an entire book this year and memorize the scriptures, right? Because when you know the truth, it'll transform your feelings. And when your feelings are transformed, it'll, it'll change the way you live. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against. That's it. And then number two, you ready for this one? Give all of your stuff, ready, to your hubby as your filter. Let hubby be your filter. And what I mean by that is run everything through him. Your social media accounts, the books that you read, the preachers you listen to, basically say, husband, I know you're here to be my protector and I want you to do it. Now, guys, listen closely. You better get on your game. You better know what the Lord wants for your wife because you're going to stand accountable for her one day. You would not let, listen, men, you would not let, you would not let a robber, a burglar break through your physical door to take your wife's body. Why will you let these Hucksters come in to take your wife's soul. Be her shepherd. What will she listen? The only podcast she's ever allowed to listen to is Date Night with the Woods from this point forward. <laughs> totally joking. Guide her. Mentor her. Care for her. And then, of course, number three is just make sure that you're in a good church. There's lots of buildings. And there's lots of pulpits, lots of songs, lots of preachers, but not a lot of real churches. You go, well, how do I know if it's a real church? And I know this isn't for everybody here. This is if you're new today or if you're watching online. How do you know if it's a real church? If the message is always about you, it's not a real church. If the message is all about Christ, then it is. What is the preacher putting in front of you every week? ironically scrolling through Instagram on Friday and I came across <laughs> the most amazing little video. It was, a, it was a, a son who was videotaping his mother who has Alzheimer's and she was sitting at the end of the kitchen table and he said, Mom, happy Mother's Day. She said, who are you? And then he figured out what was going on and he said, Mama, do you know who I am? <laughs> and the mama looked at him and said, no. Well, his dad was sitting over at the other end of the kitchen table, and he said, Mama, do you know who, who, who he is? Mama looks right at the camera, and she says, No. Kind of familiar, though, because he's always puttering around the place. <laughs> and so the son, by this point, knowing exactly what was going to happen, he said, Mama, do you know who Jesus is? Savior and he's my Lord. Ladies, that's what you want. Even if you get to the place in this fallen body where you can't recognize your own son or your own husband, some of you don't want to anymore. recognize Christ. You want to know Christ. You want the truth of Christ to permeate every member and part of your being. Because then the false teachers will never snatch you away.